A lot of energy in the room here in Cherry Hill. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, praise God. It's so good to be together. I want to take a moment and welcome all of our Glassboro Church family and everyone that's with us today online. Come on, Cherry Hill. Let's show some love. Let them know we're grateful you're with us. So glad we could be together this way. And as already been mentioned, I'm sure at both campuses, at both of our locations, we are making our way through the 21 days. Hey, listen, everybody, day 14 to 21 days, day 14. That means tomorrow we move into the last third of this, right? I like the energy in the room for, for those of us that have said no to some things in a season so that we can say a stronger and more impassioned yes to Jesus and want to encourage you. If you haven't jumped in, listen, there's still time. There's no shame in jumping in the last week, the last seven days to be a part of the season as we collectively and as a corporately as a church um, press in and seek the Lord and want to invite you. And listen, for those of you that have been in day 14 and you're like, is it 20? This is the, somebody see me today on the way in. They said, why do we call it a fast if it goes so slow? <laughs> I said, that's good. I like that. I'm going to use that every year now. And uh, it's true, but there are moments that you're going to look back and go, wow, that was quicker than I anticipated. And I'm just telling you this because this is how God works and moves, that there are going to be answers to prayers. There's going to be doors open. There's going to be direction giving through the remainder of 2023 in your life. I believe as a direct result, you take in three weeks and seeking Jesus at the beginning of the year. Anybody believe that in the rooms today? Yeah. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. So grateful that we can worship Jesus the way that we get to. You know, I had a moment as we were worshiping together here in Cherry Hill thinking about, and I know none of our minds like to go back to that, but I'm grateful for these moments. You know, the further we get away from all that time where we had to be online together a couple of years ago, right? Um, the further we get away from that, sometimes the less grateful we can be for actually being together. And I'm just thankful we can be in rooms together. Amen. Amen. Before we get into God's Word today, I want to let you know some really exciting news that we have as far as bringing back something that we haven't been able to do for the last three years. It'll be three years, but we're bringing back this year our Kingsway Marriage Conference called This Is Marriage. Yeah, that's good news. I'm glad somebody's excited, and uh, we're going to be hosting that at our Cherry Hill location on Saturday, February 18th. Today is the first day that we're letting our whole church know about that, although I did leak it out to the guys at our gathering a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if they remembered or not, but we're hearing it, some of us, for a second time today. I wanted to give them a head start, ladies, so they can get ready to register because registration is open today. You can go on to our website or our app, scroll down to events, and you'll see the marriage conference there. It'll give you a little descriptor. We're going to have a wonderful time, um, really in the Lord's presence together, prayer and communion over your marriage. We're going to get to share communion together. We'll pray over your marriages. We're going to worship together. We're going to have some general sessions and some great breakouts, be a couple meals together, a lot of laughs, and as always, a few surprises that you'll want to be there for. So I want to encourage you to get signed up for that, and you can do so on either the app or the website. And then later this spring, we're going to be hosting a Made to Thrive event. And we'll give you a date for that as we get closer. I'm still looking at some calendar options for that this spring for all of you who are not married. So we want to, we want to think about everybody across our church and both campuses and online, and we'll keep you posted uh, as we get closer to that, okay? So listen, as we move into this last week that starts tomorrow of our 21 days, and we'll break the fast next Sunday. I know we're all looking forward to that. You may be craving some things, but listen, as the cravings and the hunger increase in our physical bodies, our desire and prayer during this season of three weeks of prayer and fasting is that there would be a hunger and a craving and a desire for more of Jesus in our lives. Amen. It's to draw closer to him. It's to seek him. And I just want to let you know a couple more opportunities that you have to be with us and not walk through this fast alone. For the last number of years, as we take these 21 days, we try to set up opportunities in addition to Sunday worship services for us to come together, to pray together, to worship together, to be together. And we're going to do that again next Saturday at both campuses at 9 a.m. There'll be prayer, one hour prayer service. I got to tell you, the last couple Saturdays have been so energizing to me personally, watching people pray. Every request that comes in today's service will be prayed for on Tuesday by our staff and the next Saturday at our prayer meetings in both campuses. So they're getting covered plenty of times. Listen, we, we say it all the time. Some of us lose the, the punch and the gist of it, the heart of it. But if there's a need in your life, fill that prayer request out on the connection card because we want to come alongside of you and pray. I believe that prayer moves the hand of God. God invites us to pray. Jesus teaches us how to. How many believe in the power of prayer, but even more so in the God who's behind 
behind and has the power to answer those prayers. Amen? Amen. So we're going to continue to do that. But before we get to next Saturday, we're going to have a great opportunity just this one time during the 21 days, this Wednesday night, we're going to host it at our Cherry Hill campus, uh, a night of worship and prayer together uh, for about an hour. And then at around eight o'clock, we're going to do some baptisms. So if you have yet to sign up to be baptized, there is still time. I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, we'd love to dunk you this week. And if you've accepted Christ as your savior and never have publicly declared that, that's what baptism is. Sign up, stop by our next steps walls at both campuses. Our team can help you. You can find it on the app as well. We want to help you move and be obedient to Jesus as you take some next steps. So Matthew 6, 33, we've been in it the last couple weeks. We will be for this Sunday and next. And then we're going to go to our passage in Isaiah 55. So if you want to go and meet me there in a little bit, you can get that ready. And then we're going to do a little bit of a character study for a few moments today that I believe will um, enhance and underscore this passage, and specifically the one word that we're going to look at in Isaiah 55 today, Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 20 or chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. All the other things will be added. Can you say those words, seek first with me? Come on, seek first. Together, both campuses online, everybody, seek first. Seek first. That's what we're doing at the beginning of a brand new year. We're seeking first his heart, his presence, his desire, his plan for us, the promises that he's outlined to us that are general for all of us as followers of Christ in the word of God. And then those ones that he's made to us personally, the promises and the dreams that he's put in each of our heart that might for some of us be lying dormant or you feel like they'll never come to pass. Jesus is still aware of them. And let me just tell you this. If he's the dream giver, he's also the dream fulfiller. And it may take a while. It may take a long while. It may take a really, really long while. But he's still at work. Even when you can't trace exactly what it is he's doing or how he's working, he has in mind the dream that he's put in your heart. You know, last week we issued, I issued to you and challenged you with a 21-minute challenge. And uh, I don't know if you've leaned into it or not. I saw a couple of people at prayer yesterday like, oh, I'm loving this 21-minute challenge. And I was blown away this week as I was doing it myself of how many noises I heard externally. Oh my goodness. I literally set my timer every day this week and seven minutes at a time, seven minutes externally, and I'm writing down everything. I mean, one day, multiple planes went out overhead outside and I just wrote plane, another plane. Like I'm, I was like, I'm going to lean into this. I challenged people in our church last week. I got to do this too. Right. And, uh, there were, there was one day where my, my son was playing online with his friends and they were talking a little loudly. So I wrote that down and talking loudly with friends online, period. And uh, birds chirping outside, the hum and the whirl of the electric and the refrigerator. And then that next seven minutes, right? The second set of seven minutes in the 21-minute challenge that I shared with you last week, that internal voice. Or what's going on inside my heart? Help me, to, help me to sort through the thoughts and the emotions and not to get stuck in them, but just to recognize them, to acknowledge them. And I wrote those down. And then the last seven minutes leaning into this and praying one sentence, Lord, what do you want to say? And even in those seven minutes, I found my mind wandering. <laughs> even after 14 minutes previously of listening to both the external and internal noises around me and kind of trying to still my heart some, I realized that the challenge is always there and it probably always will be through the rest and the remainder of our lives on this earth for us to fight to hear his voice, to silence the noise and to limit the distractions. And if you haven't picked up on the 21 minute challenge, you still got seven days to join us. And I want to encourage you to lean into that. I believe Jesus is going to share some things with you. Um, I know he did with me and they were precious to me. I journaled them. I shared them with a friend who's an accountability partner this week. He actually uh, called me one morning as I had just got done. He said, I'm praying for you today. How can I pray? I was like, hold on a second. Took a picture of my journal. Send. I was like, bro, help me. Just pray, pray with me with this. And it's been so uh, fulfilling and enriching in my life. And I pray it's doing the same for you. But these 21 days, as we've been mentioning over the last couple of weeks now, are to set the course. They're to establish the direction for the remainder of 2023. So lots of resources, again, on our website and the app that you can find on our prayer guides. We have uh, plenty of helps on there for um, Bible reading guides through the year. If you haven't picked up a Bible reading plan yet online, digitally, listen, they're all over. You can find them on all kinds of apps, but on our website and app, it'll help direct you in, in one way or another. So I want to encourage you to dig into God's word in this season, because here's the deal. You can't just say no to a bunch of stuff and be like, I'm fasting, right? I'm fasting. I'm giving up this. I'm giving up that. No, no. What are you pouring back in? What are you concentrating on? What are you spending your time on? We're seeking first. 
So we go back to this passage in Isaiah. We've been looking at one word a week, Isaiah 55. I'm going to shorten it some today. We're going to look at verses 1 and just the first half of verse 2. The prophet says this, Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor or your striving on what does not satisfy? Fascinating question that we'll come back to a little bit towards the end of this. But four one-word directives. Two weeks ago, we talked about the first word there, come. It's an invitation. It's an invitation from God himself into his presence and into connection or relationship with him. And you need to see how these build upon one another. And I'm going to help us, uh, hopefully today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, recognize that and understand, man, how do we work in that? How do we get in the flow of that? How do we stay in a rhythm of what God's wanting to accomplish in our lives by, by thinking about these four one-word directives or invitations? So this word come is an invitation into his presence. It's into relationship with him. He invites us into relationship. And then last week in part two of the Seek First series, we talked about this word, listen. Listen, that it's an invitation to conversation and to learning. And you realize that when we say yes to the invitation to come into his presence, when we say yes to the invitation to have relationship with him, the next thing that begins to happen is we slow ourselves down long enough to begin conversation. And that's what prayer is, right? It's this ongoing conversation of two ways of us talking and making our requests known to God, but also listening and receiving his strength and his mercy and his grace and the words that he wants to speak over our lives. And then we think about this third word, a little bit out of sequence in the passage, but there's a progression here I'll point out in a moment. It's the word by. The word by, B-U-Y. And it's not, it's not like we would naturally, the moment I hear by, my mind goes right away to a transaction. I'm paying for some services or some goods, right? We think transactionally like that. But in this scriptures, in this verse in particular, the idea of by is to not just have a transaction, but to fully trust in something. So the word by in this text and in this context is an invitation to trusting God and to fulfillment in him, right? So we come into his presence and we can have relationship that's offered to us. We listen. We talked last week about how listening is inclining our ear. And in the original language, the idea of our ear being stretched. And I told you a little bit, gave you the image or the illustration of, of a tent. If you were to try and stretch out a tent so you can fit more people underneath it, you would take the tent pegs and the, and the ropes that were attached and try to go out a few inches or maybe even a few feet as if to try to get some more people under that. And it's the same image in the scriptures, in particular in this passage, when Isaiah, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, listen, stretch your ear out, make your ear as big as you can. In other words, give God's word priority in your life. And then we get to this word by that's a beautiful invitation to come into God's presence and to listen, but now to trust him, now to invest, now to make a commitment. And can I just say this to us? And I'm going to state the obvious here. Come on, Glassboro, Cherry Hill, those online, that there's it's one thing to say yes to his invitation to come. It's a second thing for us to slow down long enough to listen and have conversation, but it's entirely another thing to begin to place our trust in him our faith in him, our hope in him, to surrender all of the things that we don't know. I think of that passage in Proverbs, you know it well, right? To trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own what? Understanding. But in all our ways, we acknowledge him and then he will direct and make straight our paths. In all of our ways, we acknowledge him. During 21 days alone? Nope. Every day, in every situation, in every relationship, this word by is an invitation to trust and to being fulfilled. And I want you to take notice of the progression here because I think it's really important. There are so many times in God's word, I don't know if you've ever picked up on this as you've read through the Bible, as you've studied God's word, where there's a progression in the scriptures. And in this passage, it's come, listen, by, and we'll bring it to a conclusion next week as we talk about the word eat. And I'm so thankful that the word eat is on the last day of the fast. Praise God, right? We're going to talk about delighting ourselves next week. I might just bring up some desserts, like a big, big plate of desserts, right? That's terrible. And, um, but, but this word by, there's this progression. And in the scriptures, there are many times where we see progression, both Old Testament and New. One of my favorites I'll point out to you is in the book of Psalms, the first Psalm where it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, 
nor stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Now, do you realize the progression that's happening there? Think about that. As you walk along with someone, you're kind of side by side. So you're being influenced a little bit. There's minimal influence there as you're walking. But he says, as the psalmist is writing out, blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, right? To stay away from wicked counsel or stand. Now watch this. When you stand and you're not walking anymore, it intensifies. There's another step taken, but it also intensifies the influence, not just the counsel of the wicked, but blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners. In other words, now I'm engaged in conversation at a different pace. We're not just walking side by side. Now the conversation has shifted to face to face. And then it says, or sit in the seat of mockers. When you sit down and have conversation, that's another level of commitment to the conversation. You follow me in this? And there's many instances throughout the scriptures, both old and new, where there's a progression to sin and there's a progression to life. There's a progression that leads to destruction and life apart from God and ultimately death. And there's a progression that leads to righteousness, holiness, and full life in Jesus Christ. It happens all throughout the scriptures. So Isaiah isn't bringing or presenting to us anything new here. But what he is saying is we come into relationship and then we stop and we listen. And then we buy into and trust. Look at verse Two again, end of verse one, beginning of verse two. Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who are, have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. So there's the invitation to come and now to have a transaction, but not one for money or an exchange for services or goods. It's this full commitment, this full bore investment. It's a little bit like a dating relationship, right? If you've been asked out on a date, maybe for the first time, it's an invitation to come and spend some time with a person. Then there's an invitation that's not necessarily mentioned, but kind of implied that we're going to have a conversation, maybe over a meal or over a shared activity together. And through that, there's going to be conversation. You're going to get to learn about one another. You're going to get to learn the things they like and don't like, where they come from, learn a little bit more about their families, whatever else. And even though it's unspoken, if there's a second and third date and both parties enjoy being around each other, what then begins to happen is trust begins to build. The commitment begins to intensify all without you oftentimes even recognizing it. And what God is making clear to us through this passage in Isaiah is there's an open invitation to come. The invitation to listen to me is always there because he desires conversation and relationship with us. But then he's looking on our part to trust and this is where it intensifies a little bit in this series and this idea of seeking first for 21 days because it's not enough to just say I'm coming and I'm listening, but now I'm trusting. So let's play it out for us through this series and maybe even every Sunday that we have an opportunity to worship together across both of our locations and joining one another online too. We can come into God's house. And there's a level of commitment with that. It's pretty small. It's pretty minimal. We can come in and we can sit in the back if we want. We can come late and leave early. You can see or say hello to as many people you care to or don't care to, right? Like you get to dictate that. There's a certain level, a minimal commitment to just come. But it's another thing to listen. Then you're sitting there, I hope, listening to the words I'm saying today, or maybe just taking a nap with your eyes open, whatever you're doing. It's, it's all right. We're together. It's good. But there's another, there's another level of saying, Lord, will I take a next step of trust and putting all that I am in you, not just flirting with the idea of being all in, but actually going, Lord, I surrender, right? We sang about it here in Cherry Hill today, right? You could take my plans. You could take all my agendas. It's one thing to make plans, stuff them in the folder, put them under our arm, ask the Lord to bless them and walk out. It's another thing to make plans and agendas and leave them before the Lord and give him the right to change anything he wants. It's the progression that's taken place here. So will we subscribe? Will we place our trust in him? Will we fully trust and obey? We sang that old hymn growing up, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. A few people know it. I was about to start singing it, see if anybody joined me. You don't want to hear that. I think about a character, many of them in scripture, but one in particular, I think about Abraham. We know of Abraham as the father of all nations. In fact, the name Abraham means the father of many. God changed his name. It used to be Abram. And his story is a good chunk of chapters and passages that take up the space and real estate in the book of Genesis. And we don't have time to get into it all today. But for just a few moments, I want to bring out a couple portions of the story of Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 12. 
He is mentioned in chapter 11, a little bit of the family lineage and history, and then all of a sudden, these words, and for those of us, listen, I'm going to ask you as best you can, for those of you that have grown up in church or you've been in church for a while, you know the story of Abraham, you've taught the story of Abraham to your kids or some kids in, in Sunday school back in the day or a kid's way, wherever, as best as you can with the help of the Holy Spirit, try to def- defamiliarize yourself what this pass- from this passage for just a moment. And listen to these words. Let them, just, let them just wash over you for a moment. Here's Genesis 12. It says this, the Lord said to Abram, he's not not been changed. His name hasn't been changed yet to Abraham. He says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. And here's the next part of the verse. So Abraham went. Is there anybody besides me that just finds some issues with taking place in those first few verses? God did not tell the brother where he was gone. He didn't tell him how far to travel. He just said, Abram, I want you to get up, leave your house, your country, and your father's household, and I want you to go to a land that I'll show you. He didn't even tell him where yet. There was nothing, church, there was nothing to punch in on the GPS. Like he just tells him, I want you to go. And listen, if you'll go, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless people through you. I'll bless all, your, all the nations through you. And, and anybody that doesn't bless you and curses you, I'm going to curse them. Like phenomenal promise just 12 chapters into the, our Bible, right? And God goes, here's what I need you to leave. Everything that's comfortable, get this church. Everything that's convenient, everything that's common. And I just need you to go and I'll show you the way. Three words jacked me up again this week. So Abram went. He just went. Like, he didn't ask any questions. He didn't ask for an itinerary. Come on, all the planners in the rooms today are breaking out in rashes. I see some people doing this. Like, like how in the world? Where's the punch list? How do, I, how do I even begin? What are we packing? What do I need to bring? God says, take all of it. Pack up your, your country, your people, your family. Your, you got to leave all of it. And Abraham went. So some time transpires and... He's making a decision because he takes his wife and all of his livestock and everything he owns and his nephew Lot who goes off the rails. And we'll talk about that in another series, another year. But (laughs) there's a lot going on there in those couple of chapters, 13 and 14. And then we get to chapter 15, about 25 years, two and a half decades after he made Abram and and gave him this command. And Abram went and he he just goes. And by the way, at that point, Abraham was 75 years old, right? I'm, I'm... 30 years from 75, but I'm just thinking 75 in the American dream is like you're on an island somewhere, no worries, we're tired, feet up, a little fruity drink with an umbrella in it, and we're good to go for the next however many years God gives us, right? Abram 75, just starting out in the promise of God. So in chapter 15, look at these verses. After this, after what? After these 25 years, this quarter century, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be an heir. So now Abram's voicing his opinion a little bit. He went 25 years ago, and he's been going ever since, but God hasn't fulfilled the promise yet. And then verse 4 says this, the word of the Lord came to him. This man, the servant, Eleazar, will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, Abram, I want you to look up. So outside of his dwelling, possibly a tent that he was in, he walks outside. He says, look up and try to count the stars if indeed you can. And of course he couldn't. He said, for every star there is, so will your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. See, the issue with this passage is 25 years have gone by. God says, I'm going to make you the father of all nations. And Abram now is starting to ask some questions. Hold up. I haven't even had a son and I'm about to turn 100. And last time I checked, a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman can't make a baby. (laughs) Something seems off. And God doubles down on the promise. and says, no, no, no. If you'll buy into this, if you'll trust me, if you'll commit to me, if you'll trust that I'll be the one that will fulfill you, you'll see what I'll do. The next several chapters, a bunch of things transpire And we get to chapter 22, and it's this beautiful verse in verse 17 that says, I will surely bless you. God promises this. This is after his son Isaac was born. And I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Here's what happened, though, between 15 and 22, those chapters. Abraham 
with his wife, Sarah, come up with their own plan to try to shortcut God's fulfillment of his promise. And Sarah says, here, you can have my maidservant, Hagar, sleep with her. She'll bear you a son. They have this boy named Ishmael, but God says, I'm not going to bless you through Ishmael. I'm going to do it through Isaac, and your wife will give birth. And Sarah laughed at the thought of a 90-year-old giving birth, and Isaac was named Isaac, which in Hebrew means laughter. Now we have a situation in Abraham's life where what God promised him years and years ago is coming into fruition. What I didn't tell you is in the first few verses of chapter 22, the verse that we read, verse 17 there a moment ago, is where God asked Abraham to take his son Isaac, whom he was going to bless all the nations through and multiply Abraham's line. He asked him to take him and sacrifice him on the altar. I wonder how the conversation went that day. The Bible says that he was a young boy, which can mean anything from eight years old, scholars would say, all the way up to young adulthood. But of the age of understanding, most likely a teenager late in his teen years, so think like junior, senior in high school. And Isaac asked his dad the question they're walking up that day, Lord, where's, or Dad, where's, where's, the, um, where, where's the sacrifice? What are we sacrificing? And he goes, the Lord will provide. That's where we get the term Jehovah Jireh, God will provide from. And he puts, Abraham, he puts his son Abraham, puts his son Isaac on the altar, and he goes to lift a knife to sacrifice him. And the angel of the Lord stops him, and he says, Abraham, God never intended for him to sacrifice his son, his son Isaac, who he's going to bless all peoples through and make him the father of many nations. He says, stop. I know now that your heart is true. I'm paraphrasing here. The Lord tested him in order to develop his heart so that he can refine him to prepare him to be the father of all nations as he promised. And as it unfolds before Abraham, God reminds him again, hey, Abraham, not only can you not count the stars, neither can you count the sand on the seashore. That's how many descendants I'm going to give you. You know what the Bible says later on towards the back of the book, way into the, old, into the New Testament, rather, is that where the seed of Abraham and his offspring, and even those that are non-Jews, the Gentiles, have been grafted in because of what Christ has done. So Father Abraham is still the father of many, and it's been growing ever since. What am I telling you today? That when you trust and buy into God's promises, he fulfills them every single time. It's what he does. It's what he does. But here's what I've learned in my own life. Tell me this isn't true in yours, that when we accept the invitation to listen, and it's an invitation to conversation and to learning, we get that and we can sit in that seat for a little while. There's good communication. We develop a prayer life. We begin to understand God's word. And then we hear the invitation in Isaiah, right? We get into verse two, come by without money, without cost. You can buy, you can eat, you can be satisfied. And we go, okay, I like that idea. I really want to buy in. I want to trust the Lord. I really want to lean into what he has for me. I, I said yes to coming. I said yes to listening. But here's what happens. Oftentimes we get stuck in the struggle of, of listening. Lord, I'm here and I enjoy sitting here and I understand that the fulfillment of the promise is in this seat and I want to get there, but, but I like sitting in it and then kind of coming back to the middle sometimes because when I don't see it coming to pass the way I envision there's the struggle of stuck, I call it. It's this idea of being in the middle and going, Lord, I really want to trust you, and I really love your voice, and I really want to, next week we'll talk about eating and delighting in him and finding true contentment. I really want to get there, but there's this time where, where I'm struggling in the middle. It happened for Abram too, for Abraham as well, where he tried to force and manipulate. And how many of us, no raised hand, rhetorical question, have at times, if we're honest with ourselves, heard God's will, heard his plan, he's made a promise to us, and we try to, in our own strength and our great experience and wisdom, try to manufacture it or make it happen ourselves. And we become in the process manipulative and we, and we realize that, no, 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 I'm trying to make something happen and force it. And if it's not according to God's timing and his way, it's going to be a mess. Abraham created a mess by sleeping with his wife's maidservant, Hagar, and bearing his son, Ishmael, who God actually said, I'll bless him too, but I'm going to build my kingdom and establish the, my people on this earth through Isaac. So many times we try to short circuit God's plan because we get stuck in the struggle between listening and buying into, between the initial conversation with the Lord or when he prompts us and tells us to do something or that he's going to do something and actually trusting him. He asked that question that we read in Isaiah. We've been reading it every week. Listen, get this as we try to land this thing. He says, why spend money on food that will never satisfy you? Why labor and strive for things that will never bring fulfillment into your life. 
It's like you go home right from work and maybe your husband or your wife or your mom, right? Or your dad or whomever is preparing this great meal, but you're like famished from the day, right? I know this is horrible to talk about food during a season of fasting, but you go home. Anybody ever done this? And like, you know, you're hungry and dinner's going to be in 20 minutes and it smells amazing, but the senses, the sensory, you know, glands have already been triggered and you're right. Like I got to find something to just fill my mouth with, right? It's chips and salsa. It's a stack of Oreo cookies. It's whatever your favorite snack is. And you realize 10 minutes later that all I did was fill my on appetizers, I'm not really fulfilled and I forfeited the right to eat the entree. And that's what happens in this struggle of stuff. We get in this place where it's like, why am I trying to satisfy myself by doing everything else? Why am I trying to play God in the situation rather than listening to him and trusting him? That's why we sing songs like, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, for grace for grace to trust him more. You know how many times that we pray for clarity in our lives? And we should, we can, God invites us to. It was Mother Teresa who a long time ago, someone asked her to pray. She said, what can I pray for? She said, that person responded, would you pray that God just gives me clarity? She said, before we do that, I'm gonna pray before God makes things clear to you that he increases your trust. I thought, man, what a powerful prayer. So I've changed my prayer over the last several years, oftentimes. I still pray for clarity, and you should too. God, show me what to do next. Make it clear to me. But sometimes when it's unclear still, he's looking for us to trust. He's looking for us to buy into what he's offering. Not for the things that don't satisfy, not for the things that would never fulfill. And when you're stuck in this struggle between listening and trusting, listen, Look up to him. But before we pray to close this out in a moment, let me remind you of one more person who was caught in the struggle of stuck. His name is Jesus. The place is the Garden of Gethsemane. He listened to the Father. He's fully God and fully man at that time, right? Hard for us to get our mind around. He's not 50-50. He's 100% God, 100% in the flesh, human. And in his humanity, he knows that the Father has asked him to step off of his throne in heaven and to take on flesh so that he could bear the sins of the world. And he's committed to it for the 33 years that he's walking this earth. And hours before he goes to the cross, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says there are sweat drops of blood that began to come off of his forehead. And he says this to the Lord, Lord, if this cup could pass from me, in other words, if the mission and the desire that you have for my life, his mission was to seek and save the lost, if that mission that you have for my life, if, if you could just take this cup of suffering from me, I'm stuck in this struggle right in the middle of obeying you and of my own humanity in this moment of this flesh. And he says, if you could just take this from me. And then he says this powerful prayer, right? Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So in your struggle of stuck, if remembering Abraham doesn't cut it for you, look to Jesus. Here's what's so amazing about our Savior. The Bible says that he went through every temptation, experienced everything life had to offer. He knows what stuckness feels like. So this week, as you go about your days, he said, Lord, I'm committed to listening to you, and I really want to trust you, but it's a struggle. And Jesus, I'm thankful that you've recognized that and that you felt it yourself. When we trust him, and only when we trust him, can there be authentic fulfillment and joy in our lives. So a final question today. Do you trust the Lord? Do you trust the Lord? I mean, do you really trust him? Do you really take him up on the invitation and buy into what he offers? Not from a transactional perspective. From a way of saying, Lord, I fully trust you. And I know that when I place my trust in you, when it's your time and you're ready, you'll make the next step clear to me. But I'm selling out fully to you to find fulfillment and contentment in not just hearing you, but in trusting you. As you bow your heads, let's, let's pray together. Lord, we love you, and we love your word. And I pray today that we would be able to not just receive it, but to respond to it. Lord, I pray today that you've helped me to rightly divide a word of truth. And in these moments, Father, as we search our own hearts, Glassboro, Cherry Hill, and wherever else we're watching from, that we would recognize all of us at one time or another, and maybe, maybe perhaps many of us right now are in that struggle of stuck. We're between the place of listening and understanding your voice and your directives 
and really fully trusting you. We come today not even expecting to hear anything like we've been presented with, but it's as if you're talking directly to us. So Lord, in these moments, you are, it's not my voice. I didn't, I didn't plan this out. Lord, this comes from you. It's your leading. It's the guiding of your Holy Spirit. It's your direction. And Lord, it's for your people today. So who, whomever it's for today, Lord, would you seal it in our hearts? Even in this moment right now, if you're in Glassboro, you're here in Cherry Hill, you're watching in your pajamas at home, doesn't matter. You're hearing these words right now. Can I just encourage you? Can you just tell Jesus this? If he's moving in your life right now, in your heart, he's nudging you, he's prompting you. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit. You won't always hear it out loud, but he's speaking to you right now and he's asking you, will you trust me? Will it be said of you like it's said of Abraham? So Abraham went. He obeyed and believed God. He trusted God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Can you just say right now, you don't need to do it out loud. Maybe it's under your breath. Maybe it's in a faint whisper. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my marriage. God, I trust you with my kids. And I sense the Holy Spirit working in these places right now. I trust you in my career. (laughs) Lord, I trust you with my health. The doctors have given me a terrible report, but I trust you with my health, Jesus. Lord, there's financial mess all around me. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it, but I trust you with my finances. God, mentally, I'm I'm just in a tough place. I got mental health issues, Lord, or or I'm helping people with mental health issues. Lord, I, I trust you with the issues of mental health. God, I'm struggling with desires and and longings and and, and temptations and lusts that I can't find a way out of. But God, I surrender to you today. I, I trust you with all those things. Come on, express that to me in your own words today. And say it just loud enough for your ears to hear it so that your heart will believe it and stand on it. With heads bowed, eyes closed at both locations, if you've never placed your trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to give you an opportunity to do that right now. It's what we're doing. It's not my invitation. It's not a church's invitation. The father said he would send his one and only son that if anyone would believe in Jesus, sins would be forgiven and they would have new life. They'd make a brand new creation out of them. That's you today. You've never trusted. You've never bought in to Jesus's offer of salvation. I would love to pray for you today. I'm not going to ask you to stand or come forward, but you just say, hey, Phil, that's me today with a raised hand. Just shoot it up as high as you can, long enough for me to see it. I'm making, Lord, I want to trust you as my Lord and Savior today. Come on, both locations. Anybody, I'm just going to wait a moment, then we're going to pray. Lord, thank you in these moments for the work you're doing in people's hearts. And for those that are saying yes to you right now, would you, would you come and rush in Would you forgive them of their sins as they repent and turn to you? We confess with our mouth that you are Lord, and we believe deep in our hearts that God raised you from the dead. And the Bible says we're saved. We walk in instantaneously into a brand new relationship with you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.